Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're live out of the SEC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live in St. Paul over SPNN. Glad to have you here. Um, wish we were playing live in Maplewood, but you know, Maplewood decided to charge people more for less services and less information. So what a deal, you know, of course, that's the nature of that city. And we're gonna get into Maplewood uh, in how poorly ran that city is, and especially dealing with the community center. But that, it's not just the community center, but boy, you're just going to, you know, I went down to visitor's presentation, made a couple comments, and the defensiveness that came up, and the, and the way they're handling this is like, oh my goodness, I can't believe they're doing this. And so we're going we're gonna to tear apart what they said and to explain the fallacies of what they're doing and um, why, you know, there's only one reason they're getting away with it is that people don't pay attention and we're gonna find out just how people aren't paying attention and also um, if people knew, I think it would, there'd be a different story going on out there. But hey, Maplewood, it's your money. But people, even though this is about Maplewood, this kind of stuff could be or has happened in your community, especially North St. Paul, and or maybe coming to your city. And well, Shoreview's got a problem. Uh, a lot of places have problems with these community centers, but um, it, it doesn't matter whether it's community center or some other aspect of government that they shouldn't be getting involved in. It's coming your way. This will help you think through the process. Uh, we're also going to have some updates on some court issues that have come about and uh, an appellate court hearing, some other things that have happened, talk about cauc caucuses for a little bit. And then uh, the Sandra Grazzini case is uh, going to happen fairly soon. But the, the people that took the two daughters to a safe place, a safe haven for the daughters of Sandra Grazzini Rucky, they're gonna be having an omnibus hearing on Monday, March 7th at 9 a.m. to see if there is any probable cause to charge them with a crime. So this is where the prosecutor goes before a judge and says, hey, based on this evidence, this evidence, and this evidence, uh, we think they should be charged. And the judge may say, hey, there's no probable cause here. You don't have a case. And the thing could be all thrown out. Uh, so we're going to discuss that a little bit. And then we'll get into uh, Maplewood. But to start us off, you know, there's been a lot of uh, debate going on a lot of discussion on major press about Donald Trump not denouncing the KKK which he's denounced him and but he he didn't and you know but that's kind of Donald's way of you know like he's against abortions but he's for giving Planned Parenthood money and he misunderstands the purpose of Planned Parenthood and Last week, I showed a video of a second trimester abortion, what takes place. Um, it's, it's not a live abortion, but it's a graphic uh, picture. It's uh, animated as to what takes place in an abortion, uh, as explained by a, a, a doctor who's performed over 1,200 abortions. We're going to show what it looks like for a first trimester abortion. Uh, but then we're going to tie that into this discussion with President, Ob um, excuse me, with uh, Donald Trump and why he is not verse in pro-life and why he didn't have an answer that would have been great, that answer to stop the complaints about him supposedly supporting the Ku Klux Klan or David Duke. So let's watch this video here. And uh, this, oh, you know, it's graphic. Uh, parents, if you don't want your kids to see it, turn it away. 
I would say if you're uh, junior high or above, uh, parents, you want them, you, you'll want them to see this. But it's your call. I'm just giving you the warning. So let's watch the video. <laughs> My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a first trimester surgical abortion called suction DNC, dilatation and curatage. This is the most frequently performed abortion and is used typically from 5 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a speculum like this. This is placed inside the vagina and opened using this screw on the side, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix acts as a gate that stays closed for the duration of pregnancy, protecting the baby until it is ready for birth. The abortionist uses a series of metal rods called dilators, like these, which increase in thickness and inserts them into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the baby resides. The baby has a heartbeat, fingers, toes, arms, and legs, but its bones are still weak and fragile. The abortionist takes a suction catheter like this one. This is a 14 French suction catheter. It's clear plastic, about nine inches long, and it has a hole through the center. It is inserted through the cervix into the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on with a force 10 to 20 times more powerful than your household vacuum cleaner. The baby is rapidly torn apart by the force of the suction and squeeze through this tubing down into the suction machine, followed by the placenta. Though the uterus is mostly emptied at this point, one of the risks of a suction DNC is incomplete abortion. Essentially, pieces of the baby or placenta left behind. This can lead to infection or bleeding. In an attempt to prevent this, the abortionist uses a curette to scrape a lining of the uterus. A curette is basically a long-handled curved blade. Once the uterus is empty, the speculum is removed and the abortion is complete. The risks of suction DNC include perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, potentially damaging intestine, bladder, and nearby blood vessels, hemorrhage, infection, and in rare instances, even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the pre-born. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out that killing a baby that big for money is wrong, that it doesn't take you too long to figure out it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or maybe even this big, it's all the same. And I haven't done any since then and I never will. All right, we're going to uh, show week after week these uh, other videos, but obviously you can go to lifenews.com. That's where I got this video with Lila Rose. Uh, so I want to thank her and the many people for all their work in trying to get this message out as to what it's really about. And I mean, nobody knowingly says it's not a baby that's being sucked through there. But I, I think it's interesting talking about the side effects. The side effects um, are real if it was medicine uh, you'd have to know there was a battle in Minnesota and many states just to get the, I mean, the abortion industry did not want women to know of potential side effects, death being one of them. And, um, it, it, of course, you heard, saw all the side effects there, potential side effects that do happen and do happen in Minnesota. And, you know, the, the, the one thing not mentioned in there is, you, you know, you saw all those utensils. Well, we had an abortionist doctor uh, talk on the show through video that said, we never clean the stuff. That costs too much money. Uh, you know, 
and, and so the equipment was not clean. So the infections, the potential infections, and not getting all the parts causing infections, you know, and one thing they don't talk about is the mental part. And Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry has now come out with advertisements, and I forgot to get them, I'll get one next week, where you have these women saying, I don't regret my abortion. That was a good thing to do. And see, and that's, that's part of the mental disease that goes on with having an abortion, um, that you can stand there, look in a camera, and justify the murder of your own child. Because I finished my college education. I was in a bad mental state. You know, well, you could have had your child while you're going to college and gave them up for adoption. You didn't have to kill them. And it's amazing that even this doctor, after 1,200, doing 1,200 abortions, did not see that that was a human there, that he had ripped apart limb for limb all those babies. And then one day he gets it. And that's what I hope. One day you'll get it and then change. And uh, that's what I'm hoping for and hoping you understand. Now, with Donald Trump being accused of not renouncing David Duke, who David Duke renounced the KKK 40 years ago, okay, um, but with Donald not de denouncing um, David Duke and the KKK when he was endorsed by David Duke. Of course, David Duke says he never endorsed um, uh, Donald, Donald Trump. But the, the point here is Donald didn't have the comeback that he should have had. And he should have had said, okay, if you think I'm endorsing KKK or haven't denounced them, Hillary Clinton, why don't you denounce Planned Parenthood? Because every month, Planned Parenthood is killing more black people than were ever lynched by the KKK. Every month, more is being killed by Planned Parenthood than the, than the KKK lynched. See, and that's the real attack on the black culture. And Margaret Sanger, president of Planned Parenthood, founder, she knew that. She talked about that. She knew that if she got the religious leaders behind them, they can kill a lot of these black babies, a lot of the black people, and get away with it, and which she has, and which Planned Parenthood has. So Donald Trump should have said, you denounce Planned Parenthood Hillary, who's killing more blacks than um, uh, the Ku Klux Klan ever killed, then I'll, I'll renounce David Duke's endorsement, which he never gave. All right. But Donald Trump, really not pro-life as far as I understand, as far as I've seen. Okay. And also he says uh, abortion is only 3%. So he's bought into the lie. He hasn't done the research to see that abortion is a majority of what Planned Parenthood does. And we discussed that on past videos. All right. Let's go on to some uh, court updates. Uh, we had showed the appellate court hearing for Paul Hazinger, who had asked that a restraining order be taken off of him after his ex-girlfriend had um, committed a crime by looking into his driver's license record to find out where he lived when he had a safe address. Safe address is where you tell the county, hey, I'm being harassed. I need a safe place. I need to keep my address away from people. And so he scrubbed all his, um, in particular, this ex-girlfriend, um, as I understand, and scrubbed his address so that she couldn't find it. It wouldn't be found in a public record. This is something that's done for domestic violence victims over and over and over again. He even sold his house and moved to a different location so that she couldn't find him. Well, 
she found him by going through an illegal measure. And so he filed a, a restraining order against her and the judge wouldn't even look at it and give a hearing. Because, you know, even after she did this crime. And so that's why they were in appellate court saying, hey, look, she did this action. The law says we can go and uh, contest that there should be a restraining order at all uh, because of her actions of trying to find me. Okay. And the appellate court judge, Kirk, was just going bananas, kind of saying, hey, why don't you file a restraining order on her? We do those all the time. And he was very defensive in his arguments. It wasn't a normal, I, I mean, I in the court quite a bit, so I can tell when somebody's asking questions to kind of get to other judges. This was a judge who was defensive for what he thought Paul Hazinger should do. So Paul Hazinger goes and says, or, or through his attorney, Eric Cardle, says, hey, you know what? We did file a restraining order and the judge didn't look at it. Okay, well then Judge Kirk is kind of going, well, therefore you, you don't get one. Well, no, there's another process. There's a process of removing a restraining order also and Judge Kirk wouldn't allow that to take place. You know, as you can see in the courtroom, he says, no, there's better ways. Well, no, this is an option to do. This is a legal option set up in law that you can get a restraining order turned around. Well, in that conversation in, in the courts was the aspect of, hey, the restraining order's over in March 5th anyway. Okay, so big deal. Why, why are we continuing? In March 5th, the restraining order goes away. And the answer was, because she's going to file again. She just will. And that's what happens quite a bit. And so the Tubman, Harriet Tubman Institute, who goes and defends some really rotten women, okay, who are doing lying, and they know they're lying, and know they're giving false testimony, but they're going to defend them anyway, um, like Vanessa Rue. And we've talked about that on the show in the past. And what, what this woman did was ended up filing for another restraining order claiming that four years ago, uh, Paul Hainziger put a uh, icon on her laptop and caused a virus just recently and that he's been um, harassing her through the computer that he did something four years ago. And the judge granted the restraining order. That's <laughs> just, you know, unbelievable. It's, it's amazing. Well, of course, Paul has done nothing and did nothing of the sort. And there's no grounds there to justify a restraining order, but the judge gave one anyway. So fascinating uh, that it took place. And so that's why they went to appeal the district court's decision that he didn't get a hearing on any of this ish, on any of this stuff. And there's no findings of fact on anything at any time for any of these restraining orders. And he wants to have a hearing. And we'll see if he gets one. But they foresaw this coming, try to cut it off the pass. The judges go, ah, you know, big deal. And here it happens. So He's got some more, Paul Hazinger has some more uh, legal work to do there to defend himself. All right. Um, I was at caucuses last week. I told some people there that on tomorrow night, March 4th, 2020, was going to air a show about the Sandra Grazzini case. And Elizabeth Vargas has been out here in Minnesota and interviewed uh, a number of the players, not me. Uh, of course, I'm not a player in there. I've just kind of been reporting it. They have watched my show to get information um, and kind of get a framework of the case. And I told them it was going to be tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Well, 
ABC has 2020 on at 9 o'clock, okay, but they moved it back to April 9th. So as of right now, April 9th will have the Sandra Grazzini court case going on uh, and, and their explanation of it. And so a number of those people that have been interviewed, Michelle McDonald, of course, Sandra Grazzini Rucky, Del Nathan, have been on my show um, and talking about the case and talking about other things about the case. What I hope 2020 does, and if they're watching today, I hope they discuss the role of our district court judges and how much they play a part in the destruction of families rather than trying to be peacemakers and to see through a lot of the garbage that is taking place. And of course with David Knudsen, he's just a disaster. I think that's something Donald Trump would say. <laughs> he's a disaster. I mean, he made this thing so much worse than it should have been. And so that uh, 2020, April 9th, 9 p.m., that's a Friday night. So uh, that will be interesting to watch. But some updates on this. Fascinating. Of course, this Star Tribune, uh, Brandon Stahl, and then Michael Broadcourt covered this case uh, fairly extensively. But now, Sandra Grazzini was first illegally put on a million-dollar bail without a trial and without her present. Can't do that. Okay. Then, without an attorney present, I'm sorry, she was there, but they, the Dakota County was scamming the system, wouldn't, and pushed her case forward so her attorney couldn't be there, and they changed the schedule for the bail hearing. Unbelievable that they did that. They put on a million dollar bail, and her attorney complained. Michelle McDonald got back in there, and they had, they had the bail hearing with an attorney present. And guess what? Oh yeah, this is bad. Okay, $750,000 bail. <laughs> okay. Sandra Grazzini was let go out of the uh, D uh, Dakota County. The same judge that gave her the $750,000 bail just released her last Thursday on her own recognizance. No bail. How do you go from a million to seven hundred fifty thousand to nothing? Now there was a hearing, uh, and from what I have been told, uh, there's a constitutional challenge uh, going on that her Sandra Grazzini's rights were violated by the excessive bail, by the time in jail, uh, because nobody gets. Uh, maybe a very, very small bail, but this crime, if punished, the punishment is time served, two days in jail. You know, that, 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 that's what it would be. And, and, and maybe a small monetary fine or a slap on the hand, don't do this again. You know, and, and anyway, so let's bring up the graphic here from the computer. Um, the VGA, I believe, on the screen, and we're going to see. This is uh, from redherringalert.wordpress.com, and so is the screen up there? And so there's comments on here made too, but here's what the state of Minnesota, Dakota County, defendant shall be released upon the following condition. Make all future court appearances keep court attorney informed of current address, remain law-abiding. Now, and these notes in red are comments from redherringalert.wordpress.com. This only applies to Sandra Grazzini Rucky. All court professionals and David Rucky may continue with business as usual. And I'm going to get into that, what this business as usual is. She was also told no use or possession of firearms or dangerous weapons. In the comment here, David Rucky can continue to terrorize his family with firearms. Just make sure to keep the court informed when this takes place. Should have been said there, <laughs> okay, but it wasn't. Do not leave Minnesota without written court approval. Defendant is to relinquish passport of the court administrator. 
uh, to the court administrator prior to her release from jail should the defendant obtain and verify that she has current employment that requires her to use her passport to travel in the U.S. Defendant shall provide this court with verification. The defendant shall also provide the court with scheduling information before she returns, resumes employment. Released on own recognizance. Stay a reasonable distance away from victims, residents, five mile radius from residents, employment, and schools. Do not enter victims, residents, schools, and employments. Why are they victims yet? That hasn't been determined whether they're victims yet or not. Um, so that's an interesting play on the words there. Do not enter victims, residents, school, and employment. No contact with victims. You know, that, to me, that's, uh, that's uh, using language that kind of, it says you're guilty already. So it's implying in sending a message to the public that there was a victim and maybe there wasn't. A defendant will have no contact, direct or indirect, with SVR. That's her two daughters. This includes direct. Why don't they just say that? No contact with your daughters, okay, instead of calling them victims. Sign waiver, extradition prior to release from custody. Okay, uh, so let's bring up the uh, uh, graphic on the uh, WordPress. Go to redherringalert.com, and you can and scroll down a little ways, but you're going to find out a lot of information on this case and what's going on in the, the case to get an update. And the main thing I want you, other thing I want you to know, the people that took the girls and put them in a safe place, um, because the, the you know, there's a recording out there with the somebody calling, which they said was the father shooting off a gun six times, one for each of the five children and once for his wife, with that type of threat. The police did not look into it. All, uh, and that's what you hear in the Star Tribune. The police looked into it, the courts looked into it and found nothing. No, that did not happen. <laughs> okay, that's just my understanding is one of the lies that is going on out there. Nobody checked into it. If that happened, and if they did check into it, there's a reason those girls were running away and had every right to run away. And these people had the right, legal right, to protect these girls. That's written into our laws. If, to, if you see a child in danger, you can take that child from whoever has custody of that child. That's even the state of Minnesota. And that has happened before. We've had those guests on this show. What's interesting in this, the, the people that took these daughters and put them in a safe place, their omnibus hearing, which is a probable cause hearing, is Monday. And for at least one of the persons, Dee Dee Evavold, um, wh who's a friend of mine, I've known her, I didn't know this happened, that she had taken through this whole time. Of course, I met her through this process. Um, she has not received any of the prosecutor's evidence against her yet. You're supposed to have that five days before trial. Today's Thursday, she should have had it all today. Doesn't have it, okay? She did a data practice request, which you wouldn't get that evidence, but she also asked the prosecutor for the information, and she doesn't even have to ask, shouldn't have to ask, but the prosecutor hasn't released it. That right there is a defense. Your Honor, I cannot do this omnibus hearing. The prosecutor has violated the rules and the laws and has refused to give me the evidence that he has against me so that I could adequately prepare for this omnibus hearing. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen this happen in Dakota County. Don Mashek, who's been a guest on the show, before he had his brush up with uh, the false allegations that the the deputies in the courtroom filed against him. He couldn't get the information. Dakota County wouldn't give him the videos and didn't give him all the videos that he requested from day one, the day he was charged. I want these videos. And they didn't keep them, although they had them because they testified they had them. And the requirement is that if somebody asks and somebody that's been charged, they have to keep them. But they didn't. They only gave 
the videos that they thought would incriminate him. And of course, those videos didn't incriminate him. So it's just a sham. So Didi Evervold filed a complaint in the Office of uh, Lawyers Professional Responsibility against County Attorney Backstrom, filed a complaint against him on the 21st, and on Wednesday the 24th, um, Sandra Grazzini, Rucky had her case to get rid of the bail and a pretrial hearing, and the bail was taken away. Was it because of that filing against the Dakota County prosecutor and, and a number of uh, other uh, prosecutors in the process that were violating not only Sandra Grazzini's rights and also um, um, their rights for not getting the information they have a right to get to defend themselves. Who knows? We don't know, but it's interesting the timing. It's also interesting the officer, uh, the Office of um, Professional Lawyers Responsibility, the head there is Patrick Burns. And my understanding is Patrick Burns was the one who told Michelle McDonald that she better renounce her endorsement for the Supreme Court justice, and he was swearing over the phone and then said, "You're going to have to. You're going to pay a terrible price if you don't." And supposedly they were friends, but if you don't uh, say you won't run for the Supreme Court, and that was caught on tape, and you've heard that on this show. But now Patrick Burns, the head of the Professional Responsibility Board for lawyers, is got this information. So there's a lot of other information there that we'll get into one of these days when after this case is done we'll have uh, we'll have Dee Dee on the on the show. All right, we want to get into um, Maplewood, and I spoke to them about their Maplewood Community Center, and so we're going to play that clip. But it's new new members to the Maplewood City Council, so I wanted to explain to them what I saw their responsibility as, which I've already told the other council members. So let's play this clip, see what For you said. this evening would be Tim Kinley. On well, the Maplewood City Council, if you could state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. All right, Tim Kinley. Um, thank you, Mayor, council members. Uh, I haven't been here for a long time. I've uh, been out of town. Just want to welcome the new council members. Congratulations. Um, and. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Valentine's Day, Happy President's Day. Uh, lots transpired in the last couple months. Um, since uh, what, one concern I'm, I'm seeing lately, and it, it tends to happen when you have all one political party in, in office, um, is I'm seeing things on the consent agenda that I really think should just be on the regular agenda. And I'm, I'm glad you pulled off the approval of racial equity project needs assessment. That was a fascinating discussion. Uh, I was glad to hear that. That could have not been talked about. I mean, it's something that should have been there. Uh, and then there was something last, uh, last meeting, and I forgot what it is, but uh, I just appreciate that some of these things on the consent agenda really shouldn't be there. Um, so so that you can have public input on this racial equity thing. Of course, we didn't have any. Um, and for the new members here, kind of uh, just to reiterate, one of my big issues is that you're, you're not a church, okay? You're, you're, the issues you're supposed to deal with are relating to all the community and affect everybody. Uh, and with the community center, that's a special club. You have to pay to play. Uh, the taxpayers are forced to pay and subsidize these members' benefits, and it's it's just not right. It may be constitutional, it may be legal, but it's not right. Um, you're competing against your own businesses, but however, you're not because you subsidize. And I got a mailer from uh, a new workout facility that opened up. Uh, and you know, five dollars down, ten dollars a month. Nice place, real nice place, brand new. 
um, I don't I don't see how you <clears throat> can compete and, and you know as a as somebody that's been involved in business and you hear people that have to gone out of business uh, because they didn't make it 20 years you haven't made it 20 years I haven't checked the numbers I've heard rumors another year of a million and a quarter or a million dollars I could be wrong on that uh, but so far it's been a high number and it just has to change there needs to be a management change there needs some kind of change now I propose you sell the place get it off uh, our rolls put it in things that are important to the community uh, the parks and recreation and and the police the fire uh, those things it's a waste this is is a waste of our money uh, so you're not a church um, and on the uh, uh, tobacco discussion I want to thank you Brian Smith for trying to be more transparent about that um, it could have been really difficult in the past to have that happen and have people come and speak so I, I, I re and I think the community appreciates that so thank you very much um, all right all right what I <laughs> the tobacco discussion a number of businesses were being fined because of what some people call a, a sting uh, operation where kids underage go in and, and show their ID and try to uh, buy tobacco when they're not supposed to and then if the place sells tobacco to these children then the business gets fined and the individual themselves uh, can be charged with a criminal penalty and now Maplewood is doing a man, uh, an automatic arrest type thing for, for this civil thing. Uh, but what was going on there is the city council was not going to let people who had been charged defend themselves. A and people who had been charged, uh, these businesses, to say, no, here's what happened. And one of the interesting discussions in there was one lady said, hey, I want to see the driver's license that you say was shown to my employee because my employee is saying no there's something wrong with that driver's license okay so they don't even get it and the and the police the maplewood police wouldn't let them see see that's part of that scam that goes on in prosecuting people as you're seeing in dakota county is that we're not going to give you the evidence we have against you and they have to by law so why, why all this buffoonery? Why all this trickery? Why all this deceptiveness by our government officials? You know, it, it doesn't need to happen. So the part here was, I was uh, congratulating Brian Smith, a new person on the council, was that he said, you know what, I think we should let these people comment if they want to comment. They're, they're getting charged here. And we, we should hear what they have to say. It wasn't going to happen until he brought it up. Now, he didn't bring it up forcefully. He's kind of just kind of, well, should we let them say something? You know, he should have gone and said, you know, I think it's important. We're taking money from people. You know, we should hear what they have to say. They came here. We asked them to come here. Otherwise, they'd automatically be fined. You know, and, and that was the right thing to do. Okay, and a number of people, their fines went away because of the circumstances that the city knew about. And a, a number of these, the businesses had gone out of business. Uh, a couple of them, the people were out of business or the place had been sold. And so why are you finding something that the business owners didn't do and they're no longer in business? You know, so great discussion that, that that took place there. So I want to commend Brian Smith for doing that. Now, this whole thing about Maplewood using this community center as a church, they're trying to do all this social outreach. Well, that's not the business of the local government. It's kind of, you know, they're treating as the atheist club. We're going to take 
money from everybody and just give it to the select few and let the select few benefit. If you pay for a membership here, we're going to let you benefit. And yeah, we're not charging you enough. We got to charge the rest of the people of Maplewood so that you get this benefit. And and we're going to use this money to do what churches should do. Well, that's not the business of government. Okay, we have schools, we have churches, uh, and now Maplewood kind of wants to be a school. You know, they want to be a social organization, and that's not what a city should be doing. And of course, Maplewood's been wasting well over $20 million on the Maplewood Community Center because it doesn't work. So what I was surprised is that um, all the kickback that came. And so we're going to watch some of the video here. So let's see what uh, uh, Brian Smith has to say about my comments. Uh, I, I'd just like to thank Mr. Kinley for uh, coming in today and, and, and for his tone and for, um, you know, there's, there's some things you had to say that maybe I agree with and maybe I don't. Uh, but I appreciate when people can come forward with some ideas um, and some solutions. And, you know, I think we, a lot of what you brought up are, are things that we all recognize as challenges. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I think that that's the kind of discourse I'd like to see more of here. And, and you know, I, I don't think we're always going to agree, and that's cool, but, um, but I appreciate uh, the way in which you delivered it today. So thanks for coming in. Thanks. Yeah, well, it's been going on for 20 years, and you can be nice about it, but sometimes being nice doesn't work. And what you didn't see happen before there, Bob Zick made his comments to the city council, and while he was making them, Kathy Juneman, Kathleen Juneman walks out. Okay, here's somebody who can't sit there for three minutes and hear what he has to say. She doesn't like what he has to say, so she has to walk out, doesn't hear what I have to say. And by the way, she missed out on all the discussion that happened afterward about Maplewood Community Center a after my comments. She, and she didn't get to participate in it. You know why? Because she's an arrogant woman. She's, she, she doesn't want input. And she just walked out. And the, the fact that none of these city council members, and even you, Brian Smith, didn't call her out and say, where are you going? You have a responsibility, that's why you got elected, to sit here and listen. And for three minutes and six minutes, while Kathleen just y yabbers on constantly, and she can't sit still for six minutes to listen to what other people have to say, and then she won't engage in the conversation afterwards that the rest of the city council engages in. City council members, you need to hold her accountable on that. And you need to do it publicly and chastise her for that. Okay, so in that discussion then, uh, assistant city manager, which we don't need one. It's, it's just baloney that we need one. Uh, Mr. Funk talks about uh, connections that he's make, making to trying to do a study on the Maplewood Community Center and why it's losing money. So here's the plan that's kind of been rigged up here. Here's what he has to say. <clears throat> Control room. Uh, next video. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mayor, uh, I, I'd just like to thank Mr. Kinley for uh, coming no, in today. Next and, one. And, and for yeah, I'd, I'd like to play that again over and over, right? Mr. Waldron <laughs> reached out to me and, and asked, is there something of value to the city of Maplewood where we could have a partnership between uh, a highly credited uh, institution, uh, a university that has uh, students that are looking to get into government and looking to explore careers as city management or other types of uh, governmental uh, type positions. And we started talking about what might be a good project, uh, one where we could help students uh, and also one where we'd have a value for the city. And what we talked about uh, is doing a city labs project with uh, with Mr. Kaninkle as well involved in this with the MCC. Uh, so Mr. Kaninkle has been involved and in really what we're looking at exploring with this class and there's uh, nine students 
Uh, it will be led by uh, the city administrator in Ramsey, uh, who's seen his doctorate uh, in, uh, MP as a, in the uh, PA program. And so what we're going to be working on is what I would call a deeper dive, if you will, looking at community centers across the metro. Because uh, we do hear this, where our, our center does lose money. I think that's not a secret. Uh, our, our numbers reflect that. So we do have operational losses, and we've had a history of operational losses. And I, I like how he says it's not a secret. Really? When have you ever posted in the Maplewood Monthly as a headline, Maplewood Community Center loses $500,000 this year. Why? There's never been a headline, and every year there should have been a headline. Maplewood Community Center loses $1.25 million. Maplewood Community Center loses a million. Maplewood Community Center loses 250000 Every year after year. No, the community does not know that. Put it in a headline in the Maplewood Monthly. Then the community may know. But you never have done that, that I know of. Uh, I've never seen that. And yes, people have talked about it. Yes, does the city council knows about it? Right, but have they done anything over all these years? Absolutely nothing. Are they really looking? And I'm going to tell you right now, when you're going to watch this rest of the videos, they're, what they're trying to do is come up with a way to justify the loss year after year. That's what's taking place here. Um, so we're going to dive deeper. We're going to have this Hamlin University people do this research so that people involved in the government, basically, as I see it, the, how do uh, the socialists, you know, justify these things and train these nine students uh, in, the, in the argument and technique of socialism to justify losing money uh, and benefit only a selecting, selected group of people. Okay, let's hear the next clip. Certainly we can debate public policy as to should or should that be occurring, but I think part of the context of, of this conversation is understanding what's happening with other community centers. We often hear anecdotally that a lot of community centers lose money. And I think rather than talking in anecdotal terms, we want to actually get true data on the community centers that are operating in our neighboring communities. Okay, here's the smoke screen right here, okay? They're talking about finding out what's happening at other community centers. Really, you don't know what happened in North St. Paul, okay? It wasn't working. It closed down. You don't know what happened in Shoreview? It wasn't working, that, but they're financing it. It's, it's not financially sound. They know that. And they know Maplewood. They know what's going on in Maplewood. 20 years, they know. So why are you doing a study? It doesn't matter what happens in other places. What's happening in Maplewood is you're a failure. You're losing money year after year after year. And that's not what that place is designed about. And, but we want true data. We have true data. You've admitted to the true data. And see, so here's the comparison to other city councils, uh, community centers. Oh, if they're losing money and we're losing money, we're okay. That's a good deal. We're all right. That's what they're trying to do. Okay, next, ne next uh, video. And so with Hamlin, through our partnership with Hamlin that we're forging, uh, this class will take, again, is what I call a deeper dive into looking at community centers uh, across the metro and cities our size and looking at operational trends such as profit and losses, staffing levels, uh, types of services that are offered. And so we're going to uh, work with them on that project. At the end of it, we're going to have the, the class come to you and present to you kind of their findings. I think we'll ha it'll be valuable for us to know really what's happening out there um, and, and really try to see ourselves in a different light and how we kind of stack up with some of these other centers. And for us, yeah, there's consultants out there that can kind of do that work and staff can get dive into that. But here we're going to have a class that's going to help us in this process. And again, that'll be information for you and for us as staff to, to take a look at and, and do some real, real hardcore comparables. All right, here's the deal. Socialism doesn't work. Okay, comparables, 
Let's see how we compare to other community centers. Huh. Maybe we're not as bad as the rest, therefore we can justify our losses. See what's, see what's getting set up here. Um, and, and this class will come and make a presentation. Well then, Nora, Mayor Nora Slawick has some comments to add here. And, and for the public. So the public will be, I mean, it'll be a public presentation. So I think that that's going to be valuable because academic um, research is academic. It's like it's not going to be partisan or from the city's view. It's going to be, you know, how, how we kind of compare in our costs. <laughs> academic is nonpartisan. It's academic. A baloney. That's like climate change. It's like any, it's like the domestic violence industry. It's academic. No, it isn't. There's a lot of fraud going on in academic research. How many people have gone to jail for fraudulently dealing with academic research the wrong way? Tons have done that. So, so Nora's going to come out and say, boy, with the conclusions we have, this is nonpartisan. This is scientific evidence that it's okay to lose money. You know, that's kind of what we're going at. All right, uh, let's go to the next video. We're going to go through these real quick, so be ready. And so, Mr. Kaniko, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about the community center. You know, one thing I notice is I cannot, just, I've been working out there this winter, I cannot believe how busy it is on any given night. Did anybody drive by there? Did anybody come in that parking lot tonight on the way? The, the, there were so many people. I don't know what was happening tonight, but there were... Was it the play? I mean, there was an enormous amount of people in and out. The, the basketball courts are always full. There's kids' classes. There were all these little uh, eight-year-olds running up with balls, <laughs> running up and down. The, the weight room's full. The track is full. The treadmills, Mr. Kaniko, are really kind of beat up, but they're full. It's hard to get in there. You, you know, you can work out and watch TV at the same time, and, and sometimes that's a good thing. But, you know, so it's, it's a really busy place. We know that, and we know you've been making some changes, and I, I just wanted to give you the chance to talk a little bit about that. All right, there we have our con artist. There's a con artist trying with a straight face to sell, say that the place is busy, therefore we can justify the loss. No. You can't. Well, one of all, the, the place isn't busy, and one play in a busy parking lot for three hours does not make the place busy. So it's just another, busy doesn't equal uh, we're paying the bills, okay? You, <laughs> that doesn't do it. All right, so we're going to hear Dewey's answer saying, mm, you know, it's not like you're saying, Mayor. Sure, uh, Mayor, uh, Council, thank you. Uh, Obviously, this is our busy time of year, uh, so part of it is attributed to that. Uh, we are seeing some membership growth uh, in our actively aging adults, actually. Uh, all the other membership categories, we've seen some slight decline in, in memberships. So uh, we're trying to lo look at that. We're trying to encourage more families to come into the community center. And we're trying to unveil some programming that, uh, that would be conducive to families using our center. Uh, in addition, we're working with the YMCA on, on the aquatic things. So we're getting some additional uh, participation in our swimming lessons. Uh, and we hope that uh, that at some point might, uh, might bear fruit. We, at this point, it has not. And we're doing a deeper dive on that as well. Um, but uh, we're looking at different marketing efforts. We're working with the YMCA on that as we speak. And uh, we're going to see if we can't create some synergies between some of their programming and some of our programming and see if we can't do a better job recruiting uh, members for our, uh, our facility. So every reason, every reason that Dewey gave there was a reason for that community center not to exist because they're doing things that the state shouldn't be involved in, that city shouldn't be involved in. That's why the YMCA exists. That's why churches exist. Atheists need to start their own organizations and fund them themselves. Okay? This does not benefit everybody. This, and, and it's a failure, so let it go. And, and people at Maplewood, you need to start getting on board with this. You need to start saying, hey, that's enough. I talked to a guy at church uh, the other day that I was uh, attending, 
And he said, yeah, he's got a membership at the Maplewood Community Center. And I said, well, you know what? The other people are subsidizing that for you. And he goes, yeah, I got other memberships. And I said, you know, you might as well think about saving your money, go to the other places. And that was one of the discussions that w I had with um, Brian Smith afterwards and uh, Mr. Funk afterwards, a council mem member Smith, that, you know, they were saying, well, the Maplewood Community Center does other purposes. And, and, and the answer is no, they don't. There's nothing that the Maplewood Community Center does that you can do elsewhere for cheaper and probably better. There's nothing that Maplewood Community Center does that benefits the city um, that you can't do someplace else. All right, last video here of what Nora had to say uh, in closing the meeting off. I remember Council Member Abrams, we came in, that was something we really wanted to look at and I think that the council's come a long way. I know uh, that uh, Mr. Kaniko as a d director of Parts and Recreation has worked hard on that and I know, you know, it's so glad to run into you. Mr. Funk and hear about the academic research and you know we'll we'll see what all that comes together. We know it we know it loses money and that is just not a mystery at all. Um, I think we're working on solutions uh, and still looking at it and I I guess I I'm just encouraged how busy it is and how needed it is and how much it's fill, obviously filling a role in the community but how can you make the finances work out? I think that is is uh, definitely something we're looking into. Uh, the only reason it's filling a role in the community is because it's being subsidized. If it wasn't subsidized, it wouldn't exist. And it's really not filling a role in the community that you can get, can't get elsewhere and, and, and do elsewhere, and those businesses are now losing money because of that. And saying that it's not a mystery, that's trying to, yeah, big deal. Okay, we're losing money, so what? It's not a mystery. No. That does not diminish your responsibility to break even on that facility. It's an enterprise fund. All right, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great evening. See you next week.